Hi guys, welcome back. I, uh, I just want to introduce you very quickly to a few of the ideas we're going to need for the project this week. The project is called the Demon Algorithm and it uses a lot of Monte Carlo techniques which basically revolve around generating random numbers and trying to use that to simulate some kind of real randomness in nature or some random process. So the first thing I need to do is to uh, introduce you to the basic source of random numbers that we have. It's called the RAND function. So I'll fire up PyLab and just call the RAND function. You can see what it does is it returns a number. The number is kind of a random number. If I run it again, I'll get a different number, and so on. The number you get is a random number between 0 and 1, possibly including 0, but never quite getting to 1. So it goes up to 0 0.99999 or something like that. Now there's a variation of the RAND function where you pass in a number, an integer, and if you do that, it returns an array, a NumPy array, with that many random numbers in it. So you can use this to very quickly generate a large number of random numbers. And a NumPy array has some nice features that have to do with uh, logic. If I wanted to ask, let's say, let's assign this random array to uh, a variable x, and then let's ask the variable x uh, if it's less than 0.5. Well, of course, x is an array, so I can't ask an, if an array is less than 0.5 but I can ask if the elements of the array are less than 0.5, and you can see what happens here is that these guys are not, the first two are not, but the third one and the fifth one are, this guy's less than a half and that guy's less than a half. So you can see that when you compare a NumPy array with a, a floating point value, what you get is a NumPy array of booleans, which can be quite handy. There's another function called where, and what where does, you give it three arguments. The first argument is a Boolean array. The second and third argument are the values that NumPy is going to use for the true and false elements. So if I have um, Alice and Bob, notice it gives me an array of strings with either Alice if the Boolean is true or Bob if the Boolean is false. I can also generate a numerical array by putting in numbers here, okay? And you can also use actual arrays. You could use an array for the true slot and an array for the false slot, and then it will pluck values from one array or the other, uh, depending on if the Boolean is true or false. So you could say put x here and put zero there, and then what you'll get is when it's, when it's false, you get zero. When it's true, you get whatever's in X. So there's a lot of fun games you can play. But the thing I want to do is to simulate a particular problem that I'm interested in having you guys consider. It's called the drunken sailor problem. The drunken sailor problem is the following. You have a sailor, obviously, who is uh, inebriated, and he needs to get home. So he starts out probably at the front door of the bar, and he's trying to walk home, but unfortunately, because of his state of inebriation, he's unable to walk reliably. He's equally likely to go forwards or backwards. And the question is, how far is he after so many steps? And the answer is, <clears throat> you flip a coin for each step, it's a 50% chance, it's heads or tails, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, he goes forwards when it's heads, backwards when it's tails, and so you end up with a situation like this. Here we have exactly that. These become displacements. I let the plus one re represent a forward step, the minus one represent a backward step, and the sum of the step displacements is going to give me the final position of the sailor. So there you have it. He's at negative one. And I can run this over and over again by, re by regenerating the x's and rerunning. So you see how that works. If I go back up here, boom, boom, I get another displacement, and so on. So this gives me a very easy way to simulate the motion of a, a particle or a sailor that has some randomness so that it goes uh, equally forwards and backwards. Now there's a couple of other things you can do with, uh, with RAND. It turns out, let's say I wanted to have 10 sailors taking five steps. If I supply two numbers to the RAND function, I actually get a two-dimensional array and um, then if I apply my same logic, first let's look at the where. You see that this gets converted into a series of displacements. And then I can add the displacements for a single sailor by using the sum function. But I want to specify that I'd like to only add along one axis. That's the zero axis. 
Right, so here's the number of steps from the door of the first sailor, second sailor, third sailor, fourth sailor, fifth sailor. So I've got five sailors taking ten steps. So let's, uh, let's quantify that. Let's change this to num sailors. Change this to num steps. And then uh, we'll have num steps and num sailors. There we go. And now you can see uh, how that guy is going to turn out. Now, one question you might ask yourself is what is the uh, average distance from the door, not, in count, not counting the sign? So we could take the absolute value of this one, okay? And then we could divide that by the number of sailors. And that's the average, that's the distance. Ah, I need to sum that. I guess it doesn't matter if you add and then sum or sum and then add. The point is you get um, the average distance, not including the sign, of each sailor from the door. This is There's nothing wrong with this way to characterize the distance. The thing is it's not actually the way it's been done historically, and so to sort of match what has been done, and it turns out for mathematical reasons, it's easier analytically to deal with the square root of the sum of the squares than it is to deal with the absolute value. So what I'm going to say is let's square the sum, I'm sorry, square the displacements, then add them up, and then instead of taking the, um, instead of taking the absolute value, we'll take the square root. You get something that's in the same ballpark, but it's slightly different number. But it turns out this this jives with the way the thing has been studied historically, and so I'm going to go ahead and use this approach. It, you can see that it gives you a similar idea. To get rid of the signs, you square all the displacements, then you add them up and take the average, but then you've got an average squared displacement, so you need to take the square root to get it back to a displacement. So that's the notion. You end up with a number that's generally a little bit larger because you the when you square, the big displacements get weighted a little more heavily than the small displacements. But it's not dramatically different. So what I'd like you to do is to push on this a little bit. Increase the number of sailors. Let's not display it, but I can, I can say have 5,000 sailors. And then I can uh, take 100 steps, for example, and see what happens. I can uh, take 1,000 steps with 5,000 sailors, and it's easy this thing is doing, that's five million numbers you're generating there, um, but you can see it cranks through it fairly quickly. So I'd like you to explore what happens as you increase the number of sailors and increase the number of steps and see what the average displacement from the starting point looks like as a function of the number of steps. Let's say for that. So I'll, I'll give a little more detail about that in the warm-up, but, uh, but that's all I needed to show you.